You know, someone just told me that there's a couple of screens here, and yet these screens have a title for a different talk, uh, The Case for Proof of Stake. So that's not my slides. But that's all right. I don't actually have any slides. Um, so um, the title of my talk is uh, Tales from the Crypto Revolution. And when I say crypto, I don't mean cryptocurrency. Uh, I mean cryptography. Uh, all the cryptographies, uh, excuse me, all the cryptographers on the planet agree that crypto means cryptography. Uh, real cryptographers, like, you know, the inventor of uh, Bitcoin, um, would strongly object to calling um, uh, cryptocurrency uh, to shortening that to crypto. That, that name crypto belongs to the field of cryptography. Um, so, um, so, so there's two things I want to talk about today. One is uh, uh, I've been asked to tell a few stories from the 1990s, and the other is that I want to talk about uh, the rise of surveillance technology, especially how it's being perfected by uh, China and how that will affect uh, other countries. Um, so first, uh, to talk about uh, tales of the crypto revolution. Um, <clears throat> Back in the 1990s, um, uh, I, I developed uh, this software that, to encrypt email, PGP. And in 1991, it wasn't possible for ordinary people to communicate over great distances without the risk of interception. And so I developed this software, PGP, and it combined a public key algorithm with uh, a block cipher to encrypt uh, messages. And, and, it, and it had a, um, a key management model that was different from what was starting to be the, the emergence of, uh, of a centralized public key infrastructure with, with certificate authorities, where trust is dictated from on high, and everybody is forced to trust some authority that signs everyone's keys. This was more of a, a, of a different approach, a grassroots approach, where everyone can sign anyone else's key, and you just decide for yourself if you recognize the signature on the key, and, and it, it democratizes um, um, uh, a public key infrastructure. But when I published this in 1991, um, uh, it set off uh, a legal problem. Uh, the government in the US at that time had export controls on strong encryption. Um, in fact, a lot of countries had uh, uh, obstacles to strong encryption. The, the French had domestic controls. They didn't really care so much about export controls, but they cared a lot about people in France using it. Uh, the UK had both domestic and export controls. The United States had export controls, but they didn't have any domestic controls. However, um, they, in the US, the FBI was pushing to uh, to get domestic controls. And so um, AT&T uh, developed a, a, uh, a little box that attaches to your phone that will encrypt your phone call. And it had a little modem chip inside and a, uh, and a chip to encrypt your voice using the data encryption standard at that time, which was a, a block cipher from the 1970s. It, it had uh, a, a small key, 56-bit key, and, and could be broken by key exhaustion. But um, when, they, when at and built this device, um, their entire manufacturing run was, um, was bought out by uh, the NSA because the NSA didn't want anyone to buy this product. So they bought the entire inventory uh, that at and had manufactured. And then they um, came back to at and and said, um, we would like you to uh, make uh, a new product that's just like the original AT&T 3600, but instead of using the DES, use this chip called the Clipper chip. And the Clipper chip had a new uh, block cipher inside called Skipjack, and it had a larger key, 80 bits. However, every chip had a, um, a key that was burned into the chip at the time of manufacture. The government controlled the manufacture of this chip. And so they kept a backup of each of these unique keys in a vast government database for wiretap purposes. 
And so, oddly enough, uh, the free market did not accept this product, <laughs> and uh, it was not a commercial success. And so the clipper chip uh, never made it commercially in the U.S. Um, but PGP was, uh, was popular, and uh, there was another proposal for encryption called Privacy Enhanced Mail, uh, and that didn't get very far. PGP um, pretty much crushed that. But there was no company behind it. Uh, once PGP was published, it spread all around the world, and this triggered a three-year criminal investigation. I was the target of a three-year criminal investigation because um, the government felt that the spread of PGP around the world on the internet was the same as exporting it. And so, uh, at that time, it was illegal to export strong encryption. It's like exporting weapons, munitions. And so, um, so, this had the unintended side effect of making PGP more popular. So, um, so they tried to stop it, and, it, and it, they inadvertently made it more popular. And although it was pretty miserable for me at the time, in retrospect, it helped my career. So um, after uh, three years of this, they finally dropped the case. But one of the things that we did along the way was that um, uh, the MIT Press, an academic press from MIT, you know, came to me and said, we would like to publish the user's guide for PGP. And I said, well, OK, but in addition, I, I'd like you to, uh, to publish the source code to PGP in a book, because uh, publishing books and exporting books was not against the law, even if those books contained cryptographic source code. So this was kind of a, an exception to the, to the laws that prohibit the export of, of encryption software. If it's printed in a book, it was OK. And so we wanted them to publish it in a book and thereby make it more difficult to prosecute me. Um, and so they did, and uh, that s sort of uh, helped to undermine the, uh, the export controls. And then after they dropped the case against me, there were still laws prohibiting the export of strong encryption. But they, um, but, uh, they had dropped the case against me, but they still had the laws in place. So I started a company, PGP, and we decided that we were going to publish this product commercially and sell it around the world commercially, but we needed to get it outside the U.S. border, and we couldn't do that because there were still export controls. So we published the source code in a book again, and we improved things quite a bit to make it easy to, um, to scan with OCR technology, optical character recognition. And so we were able to export unlimited amounts of C source code, uh, which could then be scanned automatically in Europe and then turned back into software again. And that kind of blew a hole in the export controls. And so finally, the government in the US gave up in, the, in 2000. So it pretty much took the entire decade from the publication of PGP in 1991 to the end of the export controls in 2000. Earlier than that, the French dropped their domestic controls because they were aware that uh, the U.S. was seeing a surge in economic development because of the Internet, and they wanted to have the economic benefits of that, uh, and, and they recognized that e-commerce was an important thing, and, and they would be unable to achieve that without relaxing their domestic controls on encryption. Uh, the British also re started relaxing their export controls and domestic controls, and finally the U.S. ended their export controls in 2000. Since that time, all of our software today has, um, you know, strong encryption in it. Every web browser has uh, TLS, which is how we connect to banks for online banking or e-commerce. Um, uh, there's strong encryption everywhere. There's strong encryption in Bitcoin. Um, and so now it's strange that we, we're, we're seeing now governments once again, 20 years later, pushing back against strong encryption. I mean, it's kind of late. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's well entrenched now. It's, it's now uh, impossible to stop. Recently, Australia passed a law uh, prohibiting strong end-to-end -end encryption, but 
that's just crazy. I mean, the companies that make uh, software products that have strong encryption, they're not going to comply with a law like that. Apple has products like FaceTime that use strong encryption and iMessage. And what are they going to do? Not allow any iPhones to be imported into Australia? I, I mean, uh, I don't think the Australian voters would be too happy with that. I think it's politically untenable to try to stop strong encryption today. It's just too late. Um, so, so that's how we got to today. We had to fight for it throughout the 1990s. And uh, it took a concentrated effort by the entire computer industry. Um, Wired Magazine had articles in every single issue throughout the whole decade about um, the export controls and, uh, and uh, you know, other, other legal obstacles to strong encryption. And so now, we find ourselves in a world where instead of having to explain yourself if you're using strong encryption, where, you, where you know, in the 1990s, if you were using strong encryption, you had to answer questions, you know, like, why do you need strong encryption? Are you doing something criminal? Are you trying to hide something? What's wrong with you? You must be a criminal, or else you would not be interested in strong encryption. Well, today, we live in a very different legislative environment. Uh, today, if you're not using strong encryption, you have to explain yourself. If, you, if you're a, a, a clinic in the US and you are not protecting patient records with strong encryption, then you may be uh, in violation of the HIPAA laws in the US. Um, if, you're a, a, if you're a company and you uh, accidentally lose a laptop containing hundreds of thousands of customer identities, you better hope that that laptop is encrypted, because if it's not encrypted, you have to disclose to everyone, all your customers, that you've lost their data, that you've uh, disclosed their data, that there's been a breach. These breach disclosure laws are, uh, they started in California and then it spread around all across the US and then into Europe. In fact, the British have breach disclosure laws that have not only a requirement to disclose, but civil and possibly even criminal liability if you, um, if you leak, leak customer, if you have a breach of customer data without uh, strong encryption protecting it. Um, so the legal environment today is sort of the opposite of what it was in the 90s. Now, you're required to use strong encryption. And, and that you may be violating the law if you're not. And so, um, you know, I think it's in, in this kind of legal environment, it's impossible for governments to try to roll back uh, the freedoms that we have for using strong encryption. Um, let's see. Somebody said there was a clock here. Ah, okay. We're at about the halfway point. So I want to uh, talk about something else, and that is... Um, the rise of, of pervasive surveillance. Uh, I've been talking for the past 25 years about uh, the problems of pervasive surveillance. And surveillance technology is now uh, rapidly improving because of um, deep learning, uh, machine learning neural nets behind the video cameras. And this is most especially true in China. I mean, it's happening all over the place, but in China it's happening um, in, a, in, a, in a focused way, where they're really trying to apply this technology to improve the, the, the perfection of uh, situational awareness. Um, in China, uh, they have millions of cameras with uh, deep learning neural nets behind the cameras uh, to do facial recognition and to keep track of everyone's movement so that every single human being in China is tracked all the time. And you can see who's talking to who, who they're having lunch with, who they're meeting with, and um, where they travel, what they spend their money on. And it's uh, then fused into a kind of total information awareness uh, fusion. And uh, this means that political opposition is impossible in China. No 
opposition political party can ever get any traction just to get started. So the president of China is the president for life, and no one will ever challenge him because of the perfection of the surveillance. And this has, <clears throat> this has tremendous significance in, in, in a kind of a, in a broad historical context. If you look at what happened in World War II, you know, something like 70 million people, more than 70 million people died uh, because of uh, fascist regimes in uh, Germany and Italy and Japan. And um, after the war, everybody looked around and said, we need to find a way to prevent this from happening ever again. And so throughout Europe, this, was, this led to um, uh, the emergence of liberal democracies all across Europe to try to solidify the position of liberal democracy. And when I say liberal democracy, I'm not just talking about democracy. I mean, to have democracy, you just need to have elections. But a liberal democracy uh, goes beyond just simply having elections. I mean, you could have an election, uh, two foxes and one chicken can have a vote over what's for dinner. And that's democracy. But that's not a liberal democracy. For a liberal democracy, you've got to have uh, an independent judiciary. You have to have a free press. Uh, you have to have a population that, that has the expectation that, that democracy is important. When you think about how there, you know, Korea, uh, uh, some decades ago, was essentially a police state. And over m many years of hard work, changes happen to bring it into the present with a liberal democracy. The same thing happened in Taiwan. It, you know, Taiwan, decades ago, was also an oppressive police state, and over the course of many years, uh, evolved into a liberal democracy. And, uh, you know, of course, there are other exceptions where uh, it required a violent struggle to do it. In Romania, for example, uh, Ceausescu had to be toppled by an, ar an armed revolution uh, after the Berlin Wall came down. But in, uh, in Poland, uh, it was done more peacefully, and in, in the Czech Republic also. So what's, what happens is that um, it is possible to convince at least some authoritarian rulers that uh, it's better if they step aside and allow a liberal democracy to emerge. That they can still be wealthy, they can still, you know, have a good life, uh, but that it would be better for them, it, they, they're not going to get killed, if they step aside and don't resist the emergence of a liberal democracy. Of course, sometimes they don't listen to this advice, sometimes they hold on to power with a tight grip, and then usually in the end they get killed. And so this is a a strong incentive, I think, that um, you can make a convincing case to authoritarian regimes that um, you can't hold on to power forever, that eventually you're going to fall, and do you want to fall by violent revolution, or do you want to step aside and allow liberal democracies to emerge? Well, um, when you develop uh, uh, this, this sort of airtight surveillance that China is now developing, um, it becomes possible to debug an authoritarian regime, to refine it, to perfect it, so that they don't have to give up power. That to have perfect surveillance could allow them to stay in power forever. And that's a really bad uh, development. You know, we, we sort of benefited from having, from being able to make a convincing case to authoritarian regimes that the march of history is against them, that they might be able to hang on to power for a while, but eventually they're going to fall, and it's in their best interest to allow that transition to be peaceful. They're more likely to survive the experience. Um, but that argument becomes a little bit less convincing when you can point to China and say, look, here's a, here's a surveillance regime that is so perfect that it can totally prevent anybody from rising up in opposition. And when China debugs this, and you know, China is very good at productizing technologies, 
they're going to export it to all the other authoritarian regimes around the world. And that will make those uh, autocratic regimes also hyperstable, no matter how cruel they are. They'll be able to stay in power because of the perfection of this surveillance. And then they'll start exporting it to liberal democracies. And the thing about liberal democracies is that they're liberal democracies for the moment, but you're never more than one election away from bringing in somebody through a democratic election that doesn't share these values. And if they inherit a, a, a highly polished debug surveillance uh, apparatus, you know, that China has, has productized and exports, then they can seize power and stay in power uh, indefinitely. And that's what worries me about how surveillance technology has, has become so uh, pervasive. Um, you know, if you fight back, fight back enough, you can, you can push it back and, you know, it takes a lot of vigilance to keep um, uh, liberal democracies healthy. But we live in a world today where liberal democracies are sort of under siege. It's happened in, um, in my own country. You know, we had a devastating attack on the United States by Russia. And uh, the damage from this attack is, is uh, greater than the damage from 9-11. Um, it is a threat to our democratic institutions. Um, you know, when you have, um, when you look at, at, at when you buy security technology, let's say you're a bank and you buy a bank vault. A bank vault, they install this bank vault and it's got very thick steel doors and walls and stuff. And you, you measure the quality of the bank vault by how much time it gives you. So if uh, the bank robbers want to break into the bank vault, it takes them a lot of time to break in. Hopefully long enough that the police can come and arrest them before they can do it. And so, the, you know, so, a safe or a bank vault is rated by how much time it gives you. Uh, cryptography is like that too. Um, the, you know, the quality of, of uh, enc encryption algorithms uh, is measured in time, how much CPU time it takes to exhaust the key space or to do some kind of analytic attack. Um, well, you know, I think that, that we're, we're sort of seeing that uh, a well-designed liberal democracy that has these guardrails in place, that has sort of institutional protections, you know, if you do a good job in designing that, that is also uh, the, the, the protection that that gives you uh, that preserves the liberal democracy, that can also be measured in time. How many months or years can these guardrails withstand um, someone who gets elected and who has no respect for uh, democratic institutions. How many years of their rule before the Justice Department gets taken over by someone who just wants to protect the president? Um, you know, this is what worries me. I live in Europe right now, um, and I've been living in Europe for four and a half years, and people ask me when I'm gonna go back to the US, and I feel like, well, you know, let's see what happens in the U.S. first. <laughs> I go back to visit family, but I, I, but I always uh, return to Europe. So, um, so in the past, when I've talked about the rise of surveillance technology, it was really, there was a certain um, a level of abstraction to it. I mean, we could always point to examples of certain technologies like video cameras and, and uh, uh, d databases and, um, you know, fusion of data. Um, but it wasn't quite as focused and powerful. You know, the, the same kind of machine learning algorithm, uh, the sa same sort of machine learning architecture that made AlphaGo beat all the human Go players is now being used to keep track of human beings at, at enormous scale. And those, in fact, those deep learning neural nets uh, 
require prodigious amounts of data to train them, and, a, and a, having a billion people um, constantly being observed by uh, a surveillance apparatus does, in fact, give them uh, prodigious amounts of data. And so they just get better and better over time. So anyway, that's what keeps me awake at night. Um, <clears throat> so, um, do we have any questions? I was warned that uh, a There's Korean an audience right might, not be, might not be quite as Let enthusiastic me. about asking questions. Yeah, you. Good morning. Um, what can we do about it? That's basically it. I, I understand it's a difficult question to ask. Yeah. Um, and I don't completely agree that China is not necessarily, or Chinese people are not necessarily um, fighting back against the, uh, the government's, um, you know, uh, protection of, of them, severe protection of them. Um, but what can people do about it? Um, PGP is certainly a good technology, and we're making it better for the individual. How can we empower individuals, not just in China, but all over the world, to protect themselves? You know, I, I don't really think of PGP as being um, particularly relevant to pervasive surveillance. I mean, it has a very limited scope of what it can do. It, you know, it, it was, you know, 25 years ago, it was, it was quite, uh, quite a breakthrough, but today, um, <laughs> our problems are much more pervasive than that. I can't encrypt your face, you know? So you ask, what can I do? Uh, what can we do about it? This is the problem, is that if I get up and say all these gloom and doom predictions, then the usual effect this has is to paralyze people from despair. And um, I, I'm not trying to paralyze you from despair. I'm just... Uh, <laughs> the first order of business is to try to understand the problem. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of um, uh, clever people to come up with uh, new ideas about what we can do about it. But I, I think that mainly what we have to do about it is to work in policy space. We can't do it all with technology. We can do some easy things with technology. We can use encryption for, to protect our communications, to protect our data storage. Um, but that's only one small part of the problem. The problem of uh, the erosion of privacy is happening at so many levels and, and with pervasive surveillance in the physical world. And we are going to have to fight back against this in policy space. We have to push back and, and try to build um, a, a sort of legal legislative environment that favors uh, uh, privacy. Like, for example, in, uh, in Europe, um, Europe has a lot of um, legal machinery to try to protect privacy. It has privacy commissions. Uh, most of the Western democracies in Europe have privacy commissions. We don't have that in the US. Canada does. Um, Canada has privacy commissions both at the uh, provincial level and at the federal level. Um, and so we really should have that in the US. And the reason why we don't has more to do with uh, how the credit industry um, got there first and started um, making a big business out of uh, collecting data about everyone. But in Europe, they have legal obstacles against this. That's an example of where something can be useful in policy space. But you need more than that. You need to do something about the pervasive deployment of surveillance technology. There has to be policy remedies to that. We have to push back legislatively against that. You've come a long way in Korea in building liberal democracies here, but you have to hang on to that fiercely. Um, and, and part of that is you're going to have to pass laws and get you know, pu uh, public policy pressures to push back against surveillance. And when it comes time for China trying to sell Korea their surveillance technology, you have to say no. Any others? There's a man in front. Yeah? Um, you stated that uh, the Russia attack was worse than the 9-11. In are my you, opinion. 
Are you referring to Russia finding a way to manipulate the ideology or the perception that the American public would have or the, as far as news and content, or is there something more? No, Could you elaborate? no, no. Uh, Russia took advantage of a depressed immune system. We had already depressed our immune system for years before. They were an opportunistic infection. Uh, we had Fox News for 20 years or more. Uh, and, uh, and so that created a kind of polarization. But then with uh, social media, uh, making everybody have a different set of facts to view the world through, you know, we, we make our, our echo chambers on Facebook. And Russia exploited that. Plus, you know, the breaking into our, uh, you know, one, one party's uh, email system and exfiltrating emails and using them to influence things. But this attack um, has threatened NATO. You know, there's, there's a lot of pressure that, you know, perhaps NATO could be weakened by a lack of U.S. commitment. We don't need to formally drop out of NATO to, um, to destroy its effectiveness. If the president says, well, I'm not so sure I'll defend Europe if the Russians invade, Maybe I will, maybe I won't. It depends on how I feel that day. If he simply says those words, if those words come out of his mouth, then that eviscerates NATO. Um, and so that is a highly consequential uh, effect of this attack. Um, we're also seeing a reduction in American commitment to defend Korea, uh, the ending of military exercises. I don't know enough about Korean domestic politics to know how the Korean population views this, but it, I, I find it disquieting to think that we so easily uh, gave up such an important cooperative relationship with, with Korea. And so that's another byproduct of this Russian attack. Uh, you know, in the 1980s, I was an activist in the peace movement in the U.S. I did uh, civil disobedience. I was arrested in, uh, with uh, Carl Sagan, the American astronomer, uh, Martin Sheen, you know, and uh, Daniel Ellsberg. And there were hundreds of us arrested at the Nevada nuclear test site for civil disobedience. And I did a lot of other things uh, to train lobbyists and to teach classes in uh, military policy. This is how I spent the uh, 1980s. I had small children at that time, and that's what motivated me. So I come from, um, you know, I come from the progressive left, um, but, I, but what I see today is, uh, I, now I see Russia as a, a far worse problem because they, they're threatening uh, liberal democracies, not only in the U.S., but all across Europe. They, they gave Marine Le Pen in France uh, something like 8 million euros. Uh, they, they, they invest in these uh, far-right parties in Hungary and Poland and other places uh, in Europe, especially Eastern Europe. And so these things are undermining uh, democracy. We're seeing the rise of, of uh, the far-right. And, and when you put it in the context of having surveillance technology that is at the ready, that it's turnkey, uh, a turnkey dictatorship, you know, the technology is there, and you're never more than one election away from someone turning that key and, and igniting the, uh, the, the surveillance state. Um, so we have to push back in policy space as much as we can. We can't stop Moore's Law. You know, I, I used to talk about this a lot, that, um, that um, the human population is not doubling every 18 months or every two years, but the ability for computers to keep track of us is. And, and, and so I, that sort of looks at the rise of surveillance technology as being a blind force of nature. It's just a consequence of Moore's Law. Uh, but what we see now is that now there's a focused effort behind it. It started in the U.S. with 9-11. We started focusing technology on surveillance to try to prevent that from happening again. But you also now see it in China, 
as a way of consolidating power. And so, um, in that context of the technological development of, of, of ever improving surveillance technology, when you bring into that um, the erosion of, of uh, liberal democracies, um, maybe by uh, getting people to hate each other, to, 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 to be uh, isolated by social media into echo chambers and to become more tribal and to turn against each other, then this creates the conditions for the rise of fascism. And when you, we could, it, there was a way to end fascism in generations past. They didn't last very long, you know. Eventually they were brought down. But I'm afraid that they might not be so easily dislodged if they get a hold today when they're combined with this kind of surveillance technology.